This is Breaking Down Security, and I am Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. What's up, Brian? Hey, not much. Uh, uh, Miss Amanda, uh, Miss Berlin is not here this week. She's on vacation, see, uh, visiting the House of Mouse in Florida. Yeah, right. She, well, I've seen some of her Facebook posts. She's actually there. Um, and, you know, I think she just got pissed off at you. <sighs> Look, when she's on vacation, we can, you know, do what we want. <laughs> you know, we can let her hair down a little bit and, uh, you know. So we can we can act naughty when, when she's away. So uh, this is this is interesting for us, isn't it, Mister Betch? This is probably what our second or third show we've ever done during the day at work. You know, we're skipping out on work so we can entertain people. Yeah, I had to confine myself into the server room. Yeah, so if you hear a little hissing noise. That's just you know, it's just uh, data moving at the speed of light. Oh wow! Aren't you fancy with all your technology? Yeah, I, ours runs at the power of sneaker, at the speed of sneakers. So, yeah, <laughs> abacus, abacus power, unite. So, <clears throat> all right. So the reason the reason we're doing this special daytime episode, it's actually 1120 Pacific here uh, in the AM, uh, is because we're talking to somebody from uh, not in the U.S., which is something that I would love to do more often. So if you, you know, if you're in England, Germany, if you're in Finland, you know, China. It, China, uh, we'll have yeah. China, China should work. I think that's probably bad for everybody involved because when somebody's sleeping, the other person is sleeping. But we we can work something out. Uh, Australia, whatever you know, if you want to come on the show and uh, you know talk about information security or compliance, uh, I know GDPR is a big thing in Europe. If you are a, you know an expert in GDPR, for instance, or uh, you know, uh, Israel's passing new, uh, you know, data sharing and compliance uh, requirements. If uh, you're in Israel and can talk about that, I'd love to, to hear you talk about that. So anyway, um, we have a, a gentleman who lives in England. Uh, his name is Liam, Liam Graves. It is Liam, right? Or Liam? It is Liam, yes. Liam, okay. Because I, I know that sometimes it's it's the long, like, Liam, and then sometimes it's Liam. So uh, Liam Graves, and, and I, if you've ever heard this show, I've, I've, I screw up people's names all the time, so... Yeah. I apologize. So, um, yeah, welcome, Liam, to the show. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, right on. Uh, so for, for people who, who may not know who you are, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, where, you know, how you got to where you're at today and, and maybe a little bit about what you do, if you can, if you can tell us about that. Yeah, so I've, um, I don't work directly in InfoSec. What I work in is in systems that happen to have a strong security uh, concept around them. So, um, things like um, there are CCTV systems, which are huge um, for systems that require a little better control around their stuff. Um, that's not to say things like financial systems or healthcare systems don't have, but it's it's this is um, national infrastructure type pieces, airports and and transport infrastructure. Excellent. Okay. So. Uh... We met Liam. He's uh, he's one of our slackers on our on our BreakSec Slack channel. Uh, he you know he comes in and he has a lot of excellent content to give us. And he'd made mention that uh, he was working um, in uh, in the UK there about uh, the apprenticeship programs that were that were being done to to help uh, get people you know retrained and gainfully employed back in the system. And I found this quite interesting because uh, to the best of my knowledge, Miss Betcher, maybe you maybe you can shed some light. I don't know of any what i what what u.s considers white collar internships or not internships but like apprenticeship programs that get you skilled up on these things not government in internships it's more you know if a company wants to have an intern they can uh under the law have one um i know my wife actually did one when she uh when she graduated she had to do an internship for school. I mean, it was mm-hmm. required. Yeah. 
Well, no, I was I was thinking more of apprenticeships. You know, like when you go to high school or secondary school, you know, grades nine through twelve here. Uh, some schools have the option of going to what's called vocational technical school. So you can learn how to you know, do car repair, welding, uh, learn a valuable trade like, uh, like plumbers and, you know, um, the less what we call blue collar jobs. But there's nothing that goes, OK, well, you're going to go to a vocational technical school and get schooled up on you know, cybersecurity. Um, so I don't think, I think we have anything like that. I think probably 40, 50 years ago. Uh, the local school districts could do that if they wanted. Mm-hmm. You had a uh, someone who really wasn't cut out for school. Um, I know that uh, these these school districts would actually send them to a local business to do an apprenticeship. Hmm. Okay. As part of their curriculum, and they had the freedom to do that back then. I don't know if they do that now. Yeah. But yeah, that was a thing. Yeah. Um, in the fifties, sixties. 70s okay so so liam you um you were working with the uh the uk government and apprenticeships in some capacity yeah so i'm I'm still working with them at the moment so this is through the uh an organization called the bcs which is the british computer society and they're setting the framework for um two apprenticeship types one is for cyber technologist and the other one's uh cyber risk analyst and these are kind of what they're doing is is that they set uh, with industry a series of of targets that these uh, apprentices should hit by that point. And then the the point is that we we create how they're assessed, what kind of learning pathways should they have, um, and yeah. So it's 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 an organisation that's working for their government scheme. Now, is this uh, publicly funded, or is this private industry that's that's funding this? Um, it's a it's actually a mix. So there's there's input from the government, and then there is a, a basically a tithe on the on the companies that want to get involved in this. So um, they will then uh, be also able to drive the pathways that these apprentices have. So they give a lot of valuable feedback on on what kind of um, skills they want their their staff to have by the time they finish their apprenticeship. Very nice. And so. Um... What what's the are there any barriers or requirements to this? I mean, uh, are there any preferences? Like, well, if you were a veteran, you get preference for that, or um, if you've been you know out of work or you're in a I don't know if you're you know a, you know writing crop creator and you know there's just no work for writing crop people anymore and you want to retool. Is there a way to you know get put in the head of the line for for like jobs that have been made obsolete? Well, some of these actually, so with the apprentices, apprentices, sorry, that they will be normally aimed at those coming out of schooling here, which is um, at 18 with uh, A-levels, which is the exam to take at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but it may be later in life as well. But alongside that, this isn't the only route to get through um, Susan training of a different sort of, uh, pivot from your current employment. Um, there are a couple of other government-run schemes to get you trained up for those. Okay. What is this in lieu of? Is this in lieu of going to college, that sort of thing? Um, sometimes alongside that as well. So yeah, it tends to be that at, at 18, say you want to go into an apprenticeship scheme and you will do that instead of going to university. Um, but a lot of the companies will also include with that a part-time degree or part, a part of a part-time degree as, as you're doing it as well. Mm. It- is this faster than a, than if you went to, say, a traditional four-year college? I mean, uh, we got some links down in the show notes here about, you know, going to IBM's, you know, hiring veterans and stuff like that. And, you know, basically you go for four years and you get like an associate's degree and a certificate. And I'm like, well, wouldn't it be easier just to go to a four-year school and get a bachelor's instead? I mean, it, it, is it does it cost less to do the apprenticeship programs than it would to go to a college? So it's going to cost much less because you're not going to pay anything. You get paid for doing the apprenticeship. Oh, um, okay. It's going to take longer, though. So apprenticeship typically at this level um, is three to five years, um, depending on how fast you, you want to track yourself through that mm-hmm. or how fast the company will take you through that as well. Um, okay. It may include a part of a degree as well, but then that'll be part time, in which case a, a three year degree here would take six years to do part time. Right, right. Okay, so you've got something down here in the show notes about uh, Bloom's taxonomy and apprentices at this level will use levels one through three. Is that wh- what is that specifically? So Bloom's taxonomy really goes from between 
Um, just remembering something to the point where you're a lead um, in that, an industry leader. So right. levels one to seven. So the apprenticeship covers levels one to three, which is being able to remember something to understand why something is chosen, which is level two. And then three is like given an opportunity or, or um, say an example, which of these things would you use and why would you use that? So it's, it's getting them ready to, to be able to understand in the workplace what you would have in front of you to decide how to do your work. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is interesting. I haven't, I haven't read over this uh, Bloom's taxonomy. It sounds like uh, something that we would normally go through at our own organizations and um, you know, where you've got, you start out at the very bottom, basically like the mailroom and you're supposed to work your way up to, you know, senior manager or whatever. In this case, it'd be like you being the most junior IT guy and then moving up to like the CISO or the CSO roles in a, in a, in an organization. Yeah, exactly that. So it's just working up through those levels as you go. You said it, it uses levels one through three. That's, that's it. You're, you're, you're talking three to five years of just going from remembering uh, what these terms mean or whatever, and then applying those concepts. Yes, yeah, so you'd expect someone to exit this to be at the kind of technician level um, that they're able to, you know, given a, a set of work can go off and do that and understand what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, so you mentioned risk analyst. What what would a after coming out of this program, what would a risk analyst be able to do? I see you've chosen the one that I'm not doing, so I'm currently <laughs> working on the other one. So that's yeah. that's the that's the one I don't have too much information on. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the one you are going through right now, and 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 what what are they expecting you to get out of it at the end of the the, the session? Um, so the one I'm working on is uh, cyber security technologist, um, which is getting your hands on the kit, which is why I was I was interested in that one, um, and it's to to have, like I say, a sort of technician grade towards the end of the the apprenticeship, be able to to go off and do that work. So you you would have a look at, you would understand what an IPSEC VPN is and how it's used. And with the extra training that you'd have, because this is not just training in there, this will be, you'll do four days a week um, in a job. Mm -hmm. So you'll be hands-on with the equipment, with other seniors guiding you through this stuff. So you should be able to understand what an IPSEC VPN is, how it's applied, and how you should choose the various options within that. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> so, so that sounds a lot like uh, things like uh, certifications like Security Plus or, um, you know, maybe some CC, uh, Cisco level courses like CCNA or, or CCMP. How do those certificate programs differ from the apprenticeship programs? Is it just in the fact that you're actually getting paid to do, you know, the actual work? So in addition to, you know, because we get, we get, certificate programs that say, oh, well, you know, now I'm a, I'm a CISP or whatever. And it's like, well, you don't have any experience to, to go with the CISP. You know, you, you do have three to five years of experience to, to get your CISP, but you don't have any practical experience with regard to that. You know, do, is, is the apprenticeship a plus because it gives you, you know, three to five years of practical experience along with the, the certification or the degree that you get? That's exactly it. So um, you get the apprenticeship, which is a, which is a nice bonus to having a CV and then alongside that you have been working in industry for three to five years and there's a, that's a lot to be said for that for someone then going to find other employment or going for a promotion within that company yeah I guess uh, I guess along with it you, you before we before Mr. Betcher and everybody got on we were talking about job placement so I assume that the apprenticeship programs also do job placement or like you said if the company that you've been working with for a while likes you they're probably going to hire you on anyway Exactly. Yeah. So I did, um, I did an apprenticeship years ago for British Aerospace. Um, and I was offered a job once I finished that I did go off and take another job, but they were expected you just to just to carry on where you were. So it was quite a nice transition without having to worry, I'm going to finish this course and then have to go and start job hunting. You're, you're pretty much good to go. Mm -hmm. As long as you're worth your salt, right? There is that bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so okay so go ahead go ahead oh you're gonna okay so if you went through a, a regular degree program through through a college how um what uh, so in the u.s it's like 
okay, I've got a degree. If you, you know, your prospects may not be uh, very good. What are, what are the prospects like for somebody who comes out of a, a four year college degree in, in the UK or, or uh, elsewhere? I mean, are you, ex- are you expecting to find a job there? Or are you going to have to go abroad into the rest of the EU to, to find positions? I mean, what, what is the uh, job market like for people who are going for more technical degrees? There are there are a lot of opportunities, but let's not say there are a lot of positions. And that's um, what I mean by that is there are graduate schemes uh, that companies will run in that you won't be earning a huge amount. But what they will then do is then take you out of your degree uh, and run you through the next two years, maybe moving around in the business, trying to find a spot that you like. And that's that's one of the things to do with apprentices as well is that you won't be in the same at the same desk for, for three to five years. You'll have moved through different departments, uh, preferably. Um, with graduate schemes, that's what they tend to do. You may be three, four months here, depending on what your fit is. Um, and the intention there, obviously at that point, you're you're normally a loss to the company. But what you're looking for is retention of those people afterwards. Um, that does mean that the bar is high going into those. So I saw recently, and I, I can't find the the, um, the data to back this up at the moment, but the current intake for the cyber security um, apprenticeship uh, was 1,200 applications with, for 23 positions. Wow. So there's a big disparity between what's available. And that's really just kind of gearing up for those things. But with within graduate schemes, there's still that that appetite there, um, but a lack of positions. Okay. Damn. Liam, you're a really smart guy. I mean, why didn't you just go to Cambridge? <laughs> I'm at Royal Holloway. That's got to count for something, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He, yeah, he was telling me he plays rugby for for them, um, and he's going to be. You're going to be going to Munich next month on on tour with them, right? I play rugby for King's College Hospital, and I'm yeah, I'm off on on tour next next uh, month. And it does sound like it's something really official, and we're going to go off and play. But it's, it is thirty guys are going to spend four days with a lot of beer and one game. That's it. Well, there's a lot of beer, so there's that. Yeah, <laughs> you got that going for you. German beer at that, so. Uh, yeah, in Stein, so full liters. There you go. There you go. So, <clears throat> all right. So, when you're when you're working, you said you're going to school part time. Do you actually go back when you're you know when you're taking courses uh, in addition to your work? And do you have to discuss like work experience? And you know, uh, do you, do you get overseen by somebody you know outside of the workplace that makes sure you're actually a good fit for that organization what happens if you're not a good fit for the current place you're apprenticing with can you move to another place that's more difficult so for apprentices they have an assessor who will be looking at their um it's it's fairly light touch because really the 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 training and the guidance that you get from the company is, is guiding that the assessor's there just to make sure that everything's on track um moving apprenticeships between companies would be difficult because effectively at that point the company is the training provider um so it may well be that you could get to go somewhere else but they would you would have to restart or start mm-hmm. mid midstream which is a, a difficult task and that's really based on the judgment of the of the companies involved okay do you have uh do you do you know any others other people who are in this program and you know do you communicate with them do they have you know do they go, well, you know, I've been working at this place for three months now and all I've done is taken out the trash and, you know, checked email and stuff. Do you ever do you ever hear anything like that? Um, I haven't heard yet. So I think with this, uh, they don't start until next year um, on these apprenticeships. Okay. Um, so we haven't got any apprenticeships in our, in our company at the moment, um, but that may well change. I know in terms of um, other companies I work with do run apprenticeship schemes, but for different uh, trades, really. Um, but, but they do have, you tend to take on a number of apprentices depending on how big your, your company is. There's people to talk to as well. Right, right. <clears throat> Cause, what was that last statement? You do tend to take on uh, a number of apprentices? What? Well, that's in terms of, um, of other companies. If they're large enough, they'll take on in a year maybe three or four apprentices for a particular trade. Um, when I was at British Aerospace, that was, um, there was maybe 30 odd people that came on in a, in any given year um and i was in uh, software engineering for which there were three uh, apprentices at that point 
So is it, is it like a percentage of the number in the company? So if there's 300 people, they'll take 10% or they'll take, you know, 1%? Um, it's entirely up to the company that does that. So the companies that get involved, the likes of, um, you know, BT, some of the defense industry guys, is, um, uh, will then determine what their best fit is. What are they looking to do in, in three to five years' time in terms of um, positions? Okay. What's the incentive for companies to do this? Um, they then get a good fit in three to five years for, for an employee. So they'll be able to see, they'll be able to guide those in the right direction, um, oversee what they're doing. They know what they're going get, to get at the end. And you'll know whether you're a good fit to, to hang around after they've done with it as well. Yeah. <clears throat> see, but they still have to, they still have to pay like a salary, right? Yeah. So apprentices are, are a paid position. So, yeah. um, but they're still doing work. Um, so it's not all training. You're four days doing work, which may be menial tasks. I did some horrendous, boring code commenting and code reviews when I first started. Um, but then that's pretty much all I was good for at the time. I remember on the first day, I was thinking I'm going to be working on the best stuff ever. And it's not, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be yeah. starting sweeping floors, <laughs> moving up. Yeah. But do you get paid crap or is it a, a decent salary? It's, uh, it's not great, <laughs> but yeah. then you're, you're getting that training. So, um, I don't know, I, I can certainly look that up and put it in the show notes of what the, what the kind of levels of pay are for those, um, which would be mm -hmm. worth knowing. Um, they're not, they're not terrible, but they're not great. Yeah. So, okay. <clears throat> so you, uh, as the apprentice have to maintain specific standards, what, if any, standards do the company have to maintain so it's the company's commitment to put this apprentice through their through that scheme um i don't know if there are any punitive measures um associated with that but it's it's in the company's best interest to, to make sure that you get the right person at the end of the end of the scheme sure and i guess if you got a reputation as a company that you know you don't train your people you know the, the apprentices correctly or you know the apprentices I would assume there's some kind of exit interview or something if you decide to not stay with that company of why you're not staying with that company because they've invested three to five years in you and you're like, well, I just don't want to work with you anymore. Well, there's got to be a reason for that, right? There is. And, and you are an employee at that point. So you're not just um, just sort of an unpaid intern. So there's that, that whole kind of company support and HR support around that as well. So they want to know if, if you're unhappy, what's the issue? Can they resolve that? If you're going to leave, Okay, that's fine. Is there something you know we could have done? Something you could have done, and then um, it's a learning experience for them as well. Yeah. So, so you're more than like contract employee, but you're less than what they would consider to be a full time employee when you're an apprentice. I think legally you're covered as a full time employee. Right. So, okay. So you get like all the benefits, insurance. You just as if you were an FTE. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Is is there a test at the end to kind of demonstrate your knowledge? Like this company actually taught you something? Yeah, so there's there's assessments throughout. So there's um, what are called knowledge modules. So I've just written um, 80 questions on uh, cryptography for one of the knowledge modules on there. Um, so throughout your apprenticeship, you will then go, I'm ready to take the one on cryptography or the mm -hmm. one on um, you know, applied security and or regulations. So there's those tests, which I think there's about seven modules. Um, there's also an endpoint assessment, which is a um, scenario-based project that you're given a scenario, and then you produce the designs and the work around that. So you said you wrote the test. So you're, you're actually helping to write some of the curriculum. Is this from the, the employer perspective, or is this from the apprentice program perspective, or are you just taking the exam as a, you know for, for future people to you know, to finish. So I'm writing from the apprentice program perspective. Okay. So this is one of the, against those knowledge modules. And I, I write a series of questions based on um, what we have agreed up front and with the companies involved as well. And as part of the government scheme is, is what are we expecting these uh, apprentices to know at this point of these areas? Um, and then break that down into here's the knowledge modules based on that and the, the key learnings. Um, mm. And then it's, it's go off and create 140 questions based on those things. And it's, um, it's, it's a challenge. 
Okay. So now you can write your own study guide and sell it, you know, to publishers, right? Oh, I'm under NDA for those. So absolutely not. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> okay, so you said that well, you let's were... talk afterwards because you know <laughs> I could use a. a few so you questions. said that you were working with the with the companies. At, at what level are um, at what level is this uh, being supported by at the organizations? Are we talking mid level? Are we talking C levels? Are are getting involved with, you know, what they should and shouldn't learn? Where where are we at in, the, in with those companies? Um, I'll be honest with that one. I I don't know. So um, I'm sort of maybe two or three degrees removed from where the companies um, are, are working with them and setting these sort of schemas for the for the different um, apprenticeships. Um, so I would expect fairly senior. Mm. Um, Maybe maybe some CXOs in there as well. Yeah, I I didn't know if there was like you know special departments for you know handling you know apprenticeship programs or, or what have you. Um, so these companies are they like mom and pop organizations? Or are we talking like I know you said British Aerospace for one. Are we talking like Microsoft and and the Googles of the world? Or are we talking you know uh, mid level type organizations like Fortune five hundreds? Yeah, so it's entirely up to up to the company to get involved. So they, they register an interest and get involved with that. So it's between um, sort of um, like sm- the smaller companies are in there as well. And some of the, some of the global ones are, are there. So likes of um, Atkins, which are a consultancy, um, Arif, I think have got some as well, which is another design consultancy, um, BA systems, which I'm not allowed to call it British Aerospace anymore. It's BA systems. Okay. Um, they're there as well. BT, which is a huge telecoms provider, Vodafone, all these other ones that yeah. just um, can foreign companies get in involved in this as well. So you go overseas to do your apprenticeship. I don't know how that works because part of the part of the salary that's paid to the apprentice uh, apprentice actually comes from government funding. Um, so I can certainly check and put that back in the show notes as to, to who can get involved in those. Um, I think some of the apprenticeship schemes, like the, the framework around it, are exported just on hold. So if a company, if a another country's government wants to support that then then they can still do that uh, mr betcher you can't move there it's going to take too long for you to become a british citizen <laughs> for you to be able to join how long does it take no, i'm just kidding um <laughs> <clears throat> so back to the study guide i mean how does a company know that they're training um you know their apprentice uh on the right things in order to pass these uh, say quarterly or annually annual tests so we'll have agreed the syllabus up front so uh-huh. it's it's being um it's being questioned on specific things it may well be types of encryption so I'm, i only keep coming back to that one because i've just done it so uh-huh. fairly well versed in that um is to understand the differences between types of encryption that kind of thing so if we know that then i know that the question should be you know what are key differences between symmetric and asymmetric encryption um and i'm expecting the, the apprentice to to know that yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, um, I'm wondering. Asymmetric encryption is magic, right? <laughs> you, right? You say you say twelve, and and I say three, and the answer nobody can guess. It's it's like magical. That's the idea, I can, right? I can write down how the Diffie Hellman key exchange works if you want. After this, I'll I'll do it on paper for you. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so so what what turned me onto this whole idea of the apprenticeship thing was uh, I read a story and I'm, we've got it in the show notes about IBM hiring two thousand veterans to expand and they're expect expanding t- tech training schools. Um, they started this. Uh, I don't know when they started it, but they have a uh, a P Tech school that they use and they're. Uh, letting students uh, get a high school degree and associate degree in science and technology in as little as four and a half years. Now, I read this and I'm like, well, okay, I can go to like like we mentioned before, I can go to a four year school, get a bachelor's, and you know, in four years, you know, if I, you know, if I'm going regularly. Apparently, there are uh, IBM has these in uh, six U.S. states and in Australia as well, and they're planning twenty more in the U.S. So they're hiring two thousand military veterans, which is great because. I find that some veterans don't know how to translate what they did in the military. And this is probably universal all over. They don't know how to translate that into other fields or other, you know, ideas. So it's good to be able to, to, to move that along. Um, 
We have over here, I don't know if we can call them apprenticeships. You mentioned interns, Mr. Betcher. Uh, you know, Google and them, they do internships over the summer where people are getting paid a ton of money with the idea that I guess they can get hired later on. Uh, we don't, and, you know, we talked about not having, uh, you know, we don't have vocational schools. Uh, a lot of the, the, or the schools around here, at least in the Seattle area, are having after school programs where they're, they're learning technical skills, but they're not going and working in a company. Um, I wonder about the, the, the feasibility of, of something like this where we have more trade schools where uh, people can go and, and get the necessary training. Because this would be great, I mean, you know, for people who need to retool or, you know, people who are working in, say, you know, industries that are going, you know, the way of the dodo, like, you know, coal or, you know, oil and petroleum, where it may, you know, depending on who you are, you know, those technologies are moving more towards greener technologies. Uh, you know, I, th I think for, for our aging population need to retool, I think an apprenticeship would be would be a great idea. Well... My, my advice mm -hmm. would be, you know, what do you do between 7 p.m. and 2 a.m., mm. right? True. Are you improving yourself? Are you really putting your work in? That sort of thing to, to better yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's what I do. Yep. You know? <clears throat> yeah. So how many hours a week uh, do the apprentices work at their, at their job? Are they, are they also working at the company and then going to school during the day? Is it, is it evening classes and nights and weekends, that kind of thing? How, how are they uh, balancing the, the need to go to school along with the need to, to work? Cause that, that would be the other thing I was thinking about. Well, you know, corporate environment is eight to five. Usually you're working part time. So you may work like, you know, 20, 30 hours a week. So you can at least get some benefits. How does it work over in the UK with the apprenticeships in that respect? Yeah. So they would, um, either go for, uh, what we call, um, a day release. So they do four, four days out of five in the office and right. one day uh, training, or they do a block mode where they do a week's worth of training here and there, um, which works better. I think because if you try to learn one particular module, over a number of weeks and that's only one day a week that's going to be a struggle to retain that knowledge oh yeah um so the intention is really have five five days in a row do your training get out and that that also reflects the level of learning um that brian you mentioned earlier about the the levels one to three um is the expectation is that you could learn that module in in five days of, of very focused learning yeah I see they're encouraged to do some outside outside learning as well, but that's down to the individual um, apprentice. So we give them as much training and, and guidance in that area as possible. If you want to go and read some RFCs, or you want to go through Wikipedia, or you want to go and go through some cyber courses, go for it. That's that's exactly the kind of thing that companies would appreciate mm. um, come the end of the apprenticeship as well. <clears throat> so, Liam, what made you want to get into the information security field as it as it was? Uh, I think I'm, I'm here accidentally. <laughs> so, um, so I'm not. Uh, it's what I've said before. I think in uh, in one of the other slacks about um, I'm I'm not red or blue team. That I'm the bit in the middle really that goes. I will make the system as, as tough as possible. So my job is to make the blue team's team uh, blue team's job as easy as possible, and the red team's job as hard as possible. Um, nice. Sometimes that doesn't work out. I've got pen test reports. I've got on paper reports come back. That's I'm, I'm not the best in the world, I'm afraid. But point to someone who is. Um, but yeah, that that's where I sit really. Yeah. <clears throat> so at the end of the apprenticeship, what uh, what kind of job are you looking to land in in, the, in regard to information security? Uh, the idea is to to open those out as much as possible. So it's it's really reliant on what you're going to gain. So we've got a, a benchmark of, of learning that you're going to gain from the apprenticeship. And then there'll be the guidance that you get from your company. If the company needs if it's an NCC, it may, may not be that, but I'm just dropping that in. So if it's a pen test company and you're you're going to want to end up with penetration testers. Mm. Um, if you're working in SDLC, then you're going to want to know someone who, who has those kind of coding skills and can apply security to that as well. Okay, so it's not like, you know, no matter where you end up, you're going to start out, at, you know, once you graduate from this, if you were working for a consultancy or, you know, it didn't matter, you were going to start as like, you know, 
entry level sys law, you know, system analyst or anything like that. If you're working with a consultancy, you could be, you know, junior pen tester or something. Yeah, the idea of these is to give you a framework to to build a, a career around, to give you some introduction into what's available out there. Um, I know when I first started in the industry, I, just, I never wanted to get into software engineering. I just didn't realize what was out there and what kind of things were available. You know, people are doing firmware, they're doing, um, I did some work on voice encoding for cockpits as well. I, I didn't know that that was a thing that people do. Um, and so it's that exposure of, of what the wider world looks like. Yeah. So Liam, um, what would be some drivers to, for someone who's trying to decide whether they should do this apprenticeship or not? Um, like what, what scenarios would lead you down this path? Is it that um, you just don't do well in school or you don't have enough money for Oxford or, you know, you just want to get out there and start making some bank. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a combination of those things. It may be that you want to earn a little without, you know, if you do a three year degree here, you're going to come out in debt. It's not, it's not as expensive as, as the U S but you are no doubt going to come out in debt there. Um, yeah. It may be that you don't like classroom learning and you go, well, I can do, if I could do one fifth of the week as classroom learning, then I can get by in this. Um, if I go, I learn better doing things than get out there. Or you look at a load, load of degrees that are available. I say none of those really kind of, they're either too specific or they're too wide a field. Um, and also in, in for sec in at university level, uh, certainly at an undergrad um, is few and far between because it tends to be a, a later career move into that and very specific around um, computer science. So um, maybe that you, you just can't find what you want to do. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've, I've noticed like some things in the States, like if you go, if, if you're a weld, if you like welding, you could start making, if you're really good at welding, you could start making a hundred thousand like right away. Oh yeah. And so you're five years ahead of anybody with a degree and then they get an entry level position at what their subject matter is They're They might be making half of what you're making starting at year one. Yep. Right. Yep. So there's a lot of advantages to, to that route. If, you know, if, if you're really passionate about what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. And it may be that um, you end up with at the end of your, so you do this in three years and you've got someone who did a three year uh, computer science degree and they want to work in information security. Um, and those two CVs land on someone's desk is you've got someone who's got, may not have a degree behind them, but have three years worth of experience and um, this framework that they've done and some, and maybe some extras and overs on that. And you look at those two side by side and unless that, guy coming from university has, has done a lot more on the side, then you're probably going to tend towards the apprentice. Yeah. And plus, you know, the apprentice has experience in a corporate environment as well. Yeah. Exactly. yeah this know? isn't a shock to whereas, someone. Just, yeah. Yeah. Whereas someone fresh out of college, you know, they may not get along with, with people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So the apprenticeship puts you in a company. And let's say you don't stay with that company and you want to move on to, say, another corporation. How does how does how does somebody who's gone through this apprenticeship go to another company? And that company may not be involved in the apprenticeship program. How do you how does that how did the skills that you've learned there translate to to the new company? I mean, can you say, well, you know, because I mean, obviously, if you get a CISP or you get a CISA or you get a, a regular certificate, when you go from one company to another, that translates fairly easily. But if you go, well, I've done this apprenticeship program, they're like, well, okay, so you've done the apprenticeship program. What does that mean? Yeah, so I'd say for these ones, they're fairly new, so they're not as, as widely known. But the, the idea of apprenticeship is, and so um, if you're moving from one company to another, uh, they're things that can easily be checked. They, they're well understood and well respected um, as, as an achievement that someone's done. Okay. Okay. Because, I mean, you know another company that doesn't do this may go like, well, that's like going through sexual harassment training. You know, you've, you've done your time, you got your fancy little piece of paper, 
but you know it doesn't translate well to our organization or is this something that's mandated by the government and then go well okay we can go look this up and okay you've satisfied you know this or you you know this is equivalent to whatever it is we're looking for and that that okay so you're good to go i mean can 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 you equate it to you know any standard cuz when i was going to school i actually and for people in the states please don't laugh i went to university of phoenix to get my bachelor's degree um in information technology, but I was working and, um, you know, going to school at night at the same time, which was very difficult. Um, a bachelor's degree is going to translate well across the, across any industry. I, I just wonder about, you know, since you're saying this is very new, that it, it may not work unless you go and look for another job at a company that's also working in the apprenticeship programs. So you've kind of, you're stuck in an ecosystem of, companies that you know know about the apprenticeship versus well you may have this really nice job over here but because the this company here doesn't understand the apprenticeship program or you have to explain it to them during the hiring process it may reduce your chances of being hired by somebody who say has a four-year degree it may well do i think um apprenticeships are, are definitely well regarded um if you find a company that don't may, may not have had the, had the exposure of people coming out of apprenticeships that may not know that then um, that's a harder sales task on behalf of the apprentice who's going for that job would have to mm. explain what they've been doing for three years and what that means and what value that's going to bring to the company. Um, but no, they're, they're, they're well regarded. Um, cool. Excellent. You know, um, is there any guidance or incentives for companies to keep their apprentice on track? I mean, if they could just say, you know, I've got these three guys, let's just have them uh, manually look through millions of lines of code looking for the millennium bug, you know, and, and because we need somebody to do that. And um, we'll, we'll just get them to do it, even though they're not learning anything, right? Well, they've, they've got these these um, endpoint assessments they used to do, there's the assessor that's looking after them, um, that they will need to kind of hit those beats throughout their apprenticeship. Um, it'll be It'll be unfortunate for the gov for the um, company should they get to the end of the apprenticeship and they haven't hit that because of uh, not because of lack of application of the apprentice, but because of lack of support from the company. Um, and in which case, that ev everyone loses out there. So, what what does the company gain at the end of that? It's um, you know, well, they have years they have millions of lines of code read and made sure that the Millennium bug isn't in their code. That's what they gained, right? At a reduced cost. Is there anything to keep them on track, right? Is there any like, oh, well, you lose you lose some of this funding or we're not gonna let you have any more apprentices, you know, because you you mismanaged or mishandled or took advantage of the program. I think there are those measures in place, but I don't know the specific the specifics. So I can I can dig those out. But um, but yeah, it's the the point of a company joining the schemes is there's a partnership there. If, yeah. they, if they're not meeting their um, obligations and the things they committed to within that then that's a bit of a shame really and we can there are there are means to, to back back out of that it seems mm -hmm. like that those would be companies that have a friendlier work culture that are are you know comfortable and stable in their industry and would be able to you know take these kinds of chances for a, you know a, a smaller joint or, or something that may not be able to you know have that stability they'll only do that a couple of times and then they'll probably you know when their apprentices decide they want to leave in droves you know the government's going to step in and go hey you know why are they leaving okay well you know they came in to, to learn about networking and you've just basically had them sweeping floors for two years so you know that's you know they're going to find out eventually there's going to be some checks and balances i would imagine yeah yeah absolutely <clears throat> all right well um so one, one quick thing, I, I haven't heard of this and I really like it. I, I think it's kind of modernizing the term apprentice, yeah. Yeah. right? Because when somebody says apprentice, I'm thinking, you know, like a, uh, uh, a guy beating on a, an anvil, yeah. you know, 10 hours a day. But, but yeah, I mean, taking this um, concept and putting it into technology, I mean, I think that that's awesome. Yeah, and one of the things that I wanted to point out for this as well is this is not, um, it's not a done once 
and and that's the thing that we have for the next five years or so. This, there's a yearly review. So in fact, at midstream while we're producing this um, apprenticeship, there is uh, there's already some of the changes, some feedback from companies, and some afterthought of where we were originally to where we want to be by the time apprentices come on in September. Cool. Um, so you you mentioned two apprenticeship programs. Are there other ones? Uh, 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 coming online, or are there other ones in the future that people can uh, get involved with? There are, and I think some of them are already available out there as well. So, um, and they're they're wide ranging as well. So I know the software developers are out there, um, mm -hmm. and um, oh, there's a couple of grades within it as well. There's a software tester. Um, strangely, there's one that was um, an IT technical salesperson, which is if your if your desire is to go into doing things like RFPs and, and producing um, designs and, and quotes and things, then then we we've, we've got a scheme that will get you through that and and provide you with those uh, with those mentors. Very um, cool. Data analyst as well, um, and yeah. a digital marketer, which I was um, I need to dig into that one because it looks uh, it looks quite interesting uh, mm -hmm. that we'd have a, a specific apprenticeship for it. But these are these are created in response to what a company is asking for, where where the gaps right. um, identified, and so. Let's let's get you there. Not not next month, but we can start to push through and, and get stuff available for you. Um, you mentioned earlier that there's like a I don't, I don't know the number a hundred to one opening to candidate ratio, something like that for apprenticeships. Um, yeah, so that was I think it was twelve hundred to twenty three. Um, which yeah, a hundred okay, to one. Okay, fifty so, to one or something. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, how does that come down? I mean, what is what is the driver here? I mean, it sounds like a pretty good deal for the companies. Is it you just need more companies on board? It does, and it's it's a risk based thing. If you're a company, you would if could you sit back for a year and see how everyone else does with these first, and then consider taking that on. So, it's really um, it is fresh and new. Other apprenticeships have don't have quite the same kind of ratios, um, and so um, it's just a case of of getting that company take on and, and those positions available. Um, and it's good as well because there's this keenness and this uh, from um, people aspiring to be apprentices and get into the industry by this way. So that we, we're filling a need. And, and, um, and one, you'll be filling a need for the future is what it sounds like. So all these new schemes that are going on are, are ones that they need. Well, they need now probably some of them, but they also recognize in the future they're going to need additional help with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's uh, one of the other things I was going to say about a, a need now is to um, there are a couple of other schemes that are running to get people pivoting from existing jobs into cybersecurity, um, which I'll, I'll put in the um, in the show notes that I should have done uh, previously. But I'll, uh, I'll I'll dig those out because they'll be interested for people who aren't or are further on in their career and want to and want to move into this. Very cool. All right, so you 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 said that this is available for uh, all UK residents. So I'm, I'm assuming Scotland, Wales, Ireland, um, Northern oh, Ireland, all of them. Northern Ireland, not yeah, Southern Ireland. Sorry, Ireland. Ireland. My bad. <laughs> God, uh, I just lost them. I'm sorry. Dang it. Northern Ireland, Scotland, yeah. Wales, um, and they all have. Uh, are they all through the the UK government or all through you know? Um, do you have to go someplace specifically, like a specific university, or will are are there a number of universities that are involved with this? Um, so there are a number of number of ones available for it. So um, the best bet is I'll put a link in show notes for um, the apprenticeship application screen, which is also has links to the Scotland. Uh, sorry, there are separate ones for Scotland and Wales, but they're all linked from the same one. So right. if you're interested in an apprenticeship, go and have a look. And, Excellent. Uh, and see how you get. Right on. Well, that's all the questions I've got. I I just wish that I was a UK resident. And I could you know retool because you know this this job I've got in vulnerability management is going nowhere. So no, I'm just kidding. That's, yeah, <laughs> it's uh it's it's constant pain in the butt, and you know technology's not moving as fast as vulnerability management is with technology. So, <clears throat> well, yeah, this is fantastic. So if you're just getting out of college or you're you know you're a student, uh, you know looking for you know, training that you don't necessarily like the traditional college route. This is uh, definitely something to do. 
So, um, yeah, Liam, uh, if people wanted to uh, discuss with you the apprenticeship program, uh, how would they go about doing so? Uh, so I'm a, a constant feature on the Slack channel. Uh, uh-huh. And also I am on Twitter, but not very active. But I will respond if someone sends me anything, which is uh, Tunny Traffic, which is uh, T-U-N-N-Y Traffic. Okay. All right. Uh, are you on LinkedIn or anything like that? I am on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, if someone wants to get in touch with me via any of those two medium, and then I'll, uh, I'll drop a link for LinkedIn as well. Right on. Are you going to be uh, at any uh, security conferences uh, that people might want to find you at? I have a ticket for B-Sides London. However, Sweet. my wife's due date is three days before that. So I've got to be my wife. Ah, so it's up in the air. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, that's... Well, you know... Sims the, the brakes. Priorities. Yeah. yeah. And priorities. <laughs> she can hold it off, right? She can, you know, just, you know. I will. Uh, I'll let you discuss it with her. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not going to do that. Uh, <clears throat> no, I know better. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Liam, for coming on. Uh, I, yeah, I was just interested in finding out about this, and I'm sure there's people who are, you know, in the UK and everywhere. Uh, if, uh, yeah, if you're listening to the show and you're like, yeah, you know, my country has something like this too, feel free to, to, you know, reach out or, uh, you know, hit us up on, on Twitter and we'd love to discuss it. Maybe, maybe your, uh, your government or you have, uh, companies who are doing it in a different manner that would be uh, interesting to find out. So, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Betcher, if people wanted to talk to you about possible internships or, you know, working at your organization, how would they go about doing so? Uh, yeah, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Betcherpwned. I also have a presence, albeit less than Liam on the Slack channel. Much, much less. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're, you, you like to hang not out in the mountain. Let's go there. I, I don't have as large of a presence or not more of a presence than Liam, but, or yourself. What, what, but why don't you just there. say you work for a living and that you can't be on Slack all the time? Why don't you just say that? Of course. I, yeah, yeah, somebody's you know got to keep this place running, right? That's, that's true. You got to yeah. grab the bucket and bail, I guess. Yeah, all the things, all the things. Yep. And uh, you can reach me on IMF Security or logmd.com. That's right. That's as right. Well. Logmd. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, you can follow the official podcast Twitter at Breaksec, uh, B R A K E S E C. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You can follow me at Brian Break, B R Y A N B R A K E. Uh, <clears throat> you can download our podcast on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, uh, TuneIn Radio app, Player.fm. We're on SoundCloud. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where you can just you know listen to it streaming online. Uh, <clears throat> we're on Slack, of course. Uh, we've really turned that into something. Uh, Two hundred and sixty some people in our general channel, all all by itself. Um, we you know we're doing our CTF club. We did that last night. Uh, Miss Amanda, of course, uh, is running, uh, well, is helping to run because I'm pretty much useless at running the, the book club. But we're doing the book club on uh, on Saturdays and Sundays there. So if you want to join us and do uh, and go over the Defensive Security Handbook with uh, Miss Amanda, uh, she actually co-wrote the book with Lee Brotherston. We uh, did a show with them a couple of weeks ago about it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so we have uh, channels for malware, for pen testing discussion, our uh, Python class, which we're going to be doing a beginner's Python type course, uh, starts next week on a Thursday evening at 5 p.m. Pacific. Please figure that out on time zones. Apparently, I do not understand time zones nowadays. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we're, uh, we're constantly looking for, uh, you know, you know, good people to come in and uh, have discussions with us. So we're, we're fairly active on there and uh, we enjoy you coming on. You can sign up at uh, breaksec.signup.team. So if you go there, put in your username, the bot will send you an invitation and you can join us. So um, <clears throat> Mr. Betcher, Liam, any, any other thoughts, any other thing before we leave? Yeah, I'll be at B-Sides Austin, May 4th and 5th. Sign up if you want to go now because it will sell out. It yeah. sold out last year. Yep, it does. Um, I'll I'll be there, so come by, say hey. Cool. And, uh, right on. Liam, anything from you? Uh, nothing from me. Um, only that, yeah. If you want to get in touch, go for it, uh, and I'll. You can point out everything that I've got wrong on these friendship schemes. Oh, you didn't get anything <laughs> wrong. It's okay. So, <clears throat> all right. Well, that's it. I guess for breaking down security this week. Uh, have a have a great week, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye. Bye.